Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming this evening. My name is Madeline de Tranquilly. I'm the Vice President of the Vancouver Historical Society. We would uh, like to begin by acknowledging the traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples, and in particular, this place uh, where the museum sits, which was the site of the Kitsilano Indian Reserve. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, the Vancouver Historical Society is a member-supported organization run entirely by volunteers. And our goal is to promote and give a platform to local history and historians. We have monthly talks here at the museum on the fourth Thursday of the month. Um, and these are free for members or by donation. So tonight, I'm really pleased to introduce as our speaker, Michael Kluckner, who, um, of course, many of you know as the president of the Vancouver Historical Society, as well as the author and artist of several essential books about uh, BC history and Vancouver heritage. He has won many awards, including the Heritage Canada Medal of Achievement and the Vancouver Book Prize. He teaches at SFU and UBC. Um, and more recently, Michael has turned his creative attention towards graphic novels, which is in some way a full circle because he began his career in the 1970s as a newspaper cartoonist. Julia is his third graphic book and the subject of tonight's talk. And uh, what's really unique and exciting for me about this project is that you get to not only learn about this incredible woman's life and how she engaged with some really pivotal moments in Vancouver's history, but you also get this behind the scenes look at uh, the process of putting together a historical biography. You see the author picking apart uh, different sources and dealing with gaps in the historical record. And then there's this third layer where you see the sources themselves because the book reproduces uh, historical newspaper clippings and photos. And so you as the reader get to engage with them. And there are copies available for sale after the talk tonight. But uh, in the meantime, I'm excited to hear uh, Michael speak more about the project and tell us uh, um, why Julia Henshaw was such an extraordinary Vancouver personality. Please join me in welcoming him to the stage. And uh, thank you, Madeline, and thanks to everybody for coming here tonight. Um, I, I, one thing that Madeline didn't mention is that she was the, the primary reader and critic of the book as it evolved. And so when she's talking about the, you know, the ins and outs of the development of the things, she was encouraging me to do all this as it was going along. So uh, I'm hugely grateful to her for all of that. Um, most of you will probably know me for this type of thing. Um, and um, this is actually 30 years ago this month. I, I don't know where the time has gone. Um, but in, in books like Vanishing Vancouver and a number of other books, um, without being melodramatic about it, I, um, for about the past half a dozen years, I've found that I can really only paint Vancouver in black and white. I have no desire to paint the kind of street scenes and things that I did back in the past. It, it just doesn't seem to be that kind of a city anymore. And we'll reflect a little bit on this towards the end of uh, tonight's talk. Uh, the particular um, genesis of this genre for me, uh, this, this graphic novel genre, uh, comes out of um, a book that I did in the early 2000s, uh, Vanishing British Columbia. And it was particularly, there was a a thread that ran through there that followed an extended family of Japanese Canadians from Maine Island and Vancouver, who, uh, who ended up spending the war in the, um, in the shoe shop on a farm. And um, th this little inset photograph up at the top is of uh, Fumiko Fukuhara, uh, who was born on Maine Island. and. Uh, married and ran a grocery store on Main Street, and, uh, and her growing family on the shack on a farm, on the Calhoun farm, near Salmon Arm in, uh, in the interior of British Columbia. And then the watercolor that I did of a, the last surviving building that you could directly trace back to the Japanese-Canadian internment in that period. And I milked this story as nonfiction for all it was worth. I, I interviewed everybody, I wrote everything that I could about it. But it was such a good story, and I thought there's got to be more that I can use in this that I can tell. And so the, the upshot of it was that in 2015, I thought I would try doing this as a graphic novel, as a kind of a long-form comic book. And in doing it, 
I thought that it would open up, you know, potentially a readership for it that who would never tackle a, um, a, a standard kind of a narrative treatment in a book. And then also the numerous uh, Canadians, numerous Vancouverites, for example, who uh, who don't have English as a first language, but, but are able to um, engage with history through this type of book. And, and so, for example, in, in these uh, two little panels out of it, pointing out bits of, uh, of, of the history of the time in a way that, um, uh, you know, in a way that you would have to do in a rather didactic manner in, uh, in a typical book. And uh, as Madeline mentioned, I was a newspaper cartoonist uh, in my 20s, which is about 100 years ago. <laughs> uh, Julia Henshaw. I first became aware of her um, 35 years ago. I was looking around for um, um, the characters out of historical Vancouver that I could put in as vignettes in a book that I was planning to do on Vancouver at that time. And uh, reading the book uh, Vancouver from Milltown to Metropolis by Alan Morley, which was published for the, um, the 75th anniversary of the city in 1961, and there was this marvelous little quote in it and referring to the period just before the First World War, that kind of golden age uh, where um, the economy was good. Um, some of you may be able to read that. Uh, it's talking about a, a new species, the Playboy. Like afternoon tea Charlie Henshaw, who convulsed a yachting party and scandalized the town by providing his guests with bathing dresses straight from Paris, which disintegrated after 10 minutes in the water. And I thought, oh, this fascinating guy, and, and my, I've got to find out more about him. And he would just be that kind of colorful, anecdotal character to put into a book. And so I thought, well, I would go, I'll go to the archives and see what they have on him, and, and, uh, which I did. And all the information in the archives was about his wife, Julia. Um, who's who in Canada reference, uh, a handful of newspaper articles and so on, not a lot of information. But I, um, I published what I could, uh, what I could find about her in 1984. And um, in the book Vancouver, the way it was, but I kept on looking for, for more material. And as we did back in the day, we wrote letters to the editors of newspapers saying, please publish this, I'm looking for information. And so I knew she was British, and so I wrote to the Times of London, I wrote to Country Life magazine, I think the Daily Telegraph, um, I wrote to the Toronto Star, the Montreal Gazette, the Globe and Mail, and then the local newspapers, and I gradually accumulated um, some material about her that, that began to put together a life. And it ended up then that in London, Ontario, 1987, I found her only grandson, the venerable John Grant, uh, John Grant Morden, who was the, um, uh, the principal of Huron College. He was an Anglican cleric. And what he told me uh, at that time effectively shut the door on doing anything more uh, on a biography. Um, uh, he, he went on to say that the families had been a little bit estranged during the 1930s, and I'll get back to that a little bit later. Um, the, um, so I, I effectively walked away from it until uh, we're coming into pretty well the, the, the present tense, and there are a couple of very significant things happened, mainly the invention of the internet, and uh, sites such as Ancestry.com and then also um, a, a newspaper site called, called Newspapers.com that was searchable. And uh, all I can really say is that I'm glad her name wasn't Smith or Jones. Uh, Henshaw, she was, was relatively easy to find. And at this point, um, I must acknowledge uh, my friend Neville Hogsden, who was sitting right there, who um, did the genealogical research for me on this book, and, and uh, just a fantastic job of uncovering all these kind of details uh, that are buried within these, what are now these searchable sites. Here we go, Julia Wilmot Henshaw, born 1868. She's the youngest of seven daughters and one son of a very, very prosperous uh, carpet manufacturing company in Durham, England. Um, 
Uh, Henderson's Durham Carpet Factory was a very big enterprise, and William Henderson himself was the kind of character that you, you see in a lot of Victorian novels, novels like Dickens. He's, he's the middle class, kind of on his way to being not an aristocrat in any way, but very active in Tory politics, um, hunting and shooting, that, that, that English thing in the 19th century of killing fish and small birds as a major occupation. And uh, he was also an author in his own way, which was, um, he wrote a very good book on, on angling, the, the pleasures of angling. So very much a man of that time. And his love of the outdoors he communicated to at least his daughter Julia, if not to, um, to other daughters. In uh, 1885, this 16-year-old Julia Henderson comes uh, from, uh, Port of Liverpool to Port of Philadelphia. She is on her way to join her uh, eldest sister, who is married to the rector of Christ Church Cathedral in Montreal. So that's how Julia gets to, um, uh, gets to Canada when she's 16 years old. And uh, the following year, when she's 17, she begins to be courted by a man named Charles Henshaw. And Charles is about eight years older than her, and so not, you know, a pretty typical split in that social class between the age of the man and the age of the, the, age of the woman. And, um, and, and Charles um, styled himself as being a United Empire loyalist, a part of a United Empire loyalist family. But in fact, um, his family left uh, Vermont in the, in the 1820s, so about 40 years after the American Revolution to escape creditors. Um, <laughs> He also, um, uh, Charles, he's, he, he said to people that he was a relative of the Earl of Derby. And the Earl of Derby, better known as Baron Stanley of Preston, who is the Stanley of Stanley Park and the Stanley Cup and so on, uh, was of course the Governor General of Canada at, at that period. And um, in fact, uh, Charles was ninth cousin of, um, uh, of uh, the Earl of Derby, which means he's about as closely related to him as I am to Picasso. <laughs> they, um, they marry uh, when Julia is 18 in, um, uh, in, in uh, 1887, and they have one daughter in 1889, and I will come back to the daughter uh, considerably later on in this piece. And then in 1890, they move to Vancouver when Vancouver is four years old. And, uh, and Charles sets himself up with a couple of uh, associates in a business as commission agents, manufacturers agents on Water Street in Gastown, but also as you'll see in the, in the advertisement there, um, they, they have an office in Nelson, so they're obviously selling into the mining industry in the uh, interior of British Columbia. As for Julia, she, um, adopted the life of a middle class or upper middle class uh, woman of the time and partly dependent on the availability of, of um, uh, an affordable servant, who almost invariably Chinese at, at that point. And with her available leisure, she did the things that women did and this, these were women who were living in the West End, which was where society was in Vancouver at that time. The calling card ritual and then she's noted in um, in newspapers at the time as, as being really quite a good actress in, uh, in amateur theatrics. But while she's still in her 20s, she begins to develop a bit of a reputation as a public intellectual, uh, what we would now call a public intellectual. Um, in, in this lecture, when she's 28 years old to the National Council of Women meeting in Vancouver, she's saying and, and uh, I'll just read a little bit of it, that um, she's talking about how in, in the immediate past that there was a strong tendency towards the suppression and ridiculing of all women's higher aims and ambitions, but in this fin de siècle, much of that has changed. And so she's, she's obviously staking out a pretty progressive uh, uh, type of position at that point. Just at the point that she turns 30, her first novel is published, hypnotized a kind of a gothic uh, melodrama, and um, it uh, set in England, published in England and in Canada, and she writes it and publishes it under the name Julian Durham, under a male nom de plume, which is also very typical of, of women at that time of that class, and you can think of um, 
and think of a whole number of George Eliot and, and uh, the Bronte sisters and the rest of them. Um, she also, when the province newspaper moves from Victoria to Vancouver in 1898 and becomes a daily, she lands a job as the music and theater critic for it. And um, she's 29 years old and, uh, and, and a very erudite uh, woman, rather, um, rather sharp-tongued, um, perhaps a little bit too prone to tossing in bits of Latin, bits of German, bits of French into what she's writing. And uh, so Julian Durham, as the critic with that byline, doesn't last very long. I think that she was like, a little bit too big for Vancouver at that period. But she's, uh, she spreads her wings out, and for example, with this article in Canadian Magazine, which published out of Toronto, um, she absolutely nails Vancouver. I don't think anybody has done a better job of describing what knits Vancouver together than Julia did when Vancouver was 12 years old. The almighty dollar being the goal of everybody who is here. Her second novel, she begins in 1898, and there's this interesting set of circumstances that happen there that Walter Nickel, the, the publisher of the province newspaper, commissions her to go out and write a series of articles called British Columbia Up to Date, and she starts in Victoria and Vancouver and New Westminster, and she goes up into the interior of British Columbia. And particularly in the period when she's in the Kootenays and she's traveling with, with uh, uh, Charles, who is probably doing sales calls, I would expect, um, when they're up there. She, uh, she is staging this second novel, which is what you would probably call a sensation novel of the period, like uh, the, the, the kind of genre that was pioneered by Wilkie Collins. Um, one breathless event follows another, and I'll return to it a little bit at the end because there are a couple of themes in it that are, that are rather fun. She, um, by January 1902, she's um, a, a celebrity. She's number 30 in the series of Canadian celebrities published out of Toronto by a Canadian magazine. And this whole um, a portrait of her is reproduced in the book. Um, and uh, the, um, these, these details of, of her life, and, and you can see a kind of a trend of exaggeration in what she's uh, doing to describe herself. And also from 1901 to 1910, she, she's separated completely from the province, certainly by, by 1900, 1901. It's hard to tell because of the number of bylines. But she takes over the, the women's section of the Daily News Advertiser, and it's actually the first two pages of the second section of the Sunday newspaper. So it's a lot of writing and a very, very varied work. And so this is from a woman's point of view, and it's by Gwen. And I was saying at a, at a talk I gave um, last week about this that I, have no, I had no idea where Gwen came from. And somebody came up to me after and he said, take a look at that signature. You can see maybe JWH in there or some kind of almost a, a, a Julia form in that, if you look at it hard enough. And I'm not totally convinced uh, that that's the case. But it's a very, very varied work. It's got politics in it. It's got um, uh, the kind of music and drama and book criticism that she was doing elsewhere. And um, then a little bit of the standard kind of puff of women's sections of that time, um, etiquette, fashion, cooking, that sort of thing. Um, if you've um, read anything about Julia Henshaw, you will probably and this would be on the internet, and it dates back to a 1990 article in BC Studies where um, a spoof of Julia under the name of Gowan was, uh, that was published in the province was misidentified as being her. And in fact, I mean, it, if you read enough of her columns in this kind of lofty persona that she had, it's not surprising that, that a group of people unknown in the province decided to um, to parody her style, and so Gowan appears a handful of times in the province and then disappears, but it's definitely uh, Julia as Gwen and the Daily News Advertiser. 
She writes magazine articles. She gets, develops quite a reputation as an adventurer, as a, as a woman going out. And, and this is just one of the several examples that are around the, a summer holiday in the Rockies. She gives women advice on what they should take when they're traveling, including what kind of rifle they should buy if they're interested in shooting birds and small game. Um, I have um, drawn her there uh, riding side saddle, though that in spite of the fact that she was in some ways quite a, uh, an adventurous and modern woman, she continued to ride side saddle and she, um, and she actually defended the practice in her newspaper column at one point. And this is about a decade after um, other women began to ride straddle and jodhpurs became popular and so on. But again, it's kind of a social class thing. So you'll, you'll see that emerging as one of the principal themes in here. Along the way, uh, and this is in Glacier, BC, which is no longer really exists, it's in the middle of the Rogers Pass. Um, there was a CPR Mountain Hotel at Glacier around the turn of the 20th century. And it was a gathering place for um, a, a group of people, and uh, they were wealthy Americans from Philadelphia, the Schaffers and the Vox family. And they, they figure very strongly in the history of the Selkirk Mountains and the Rocky Mountains. And Charles Schaffer, who was a physician, um, had uh, set out to write what he said would be the first botanical guide to the Rocky Mountains, uh, to, the, to the mountains of Western Canada, uh, the Selkirks. And Julia met them at that point and began to tag along on this. And um, it becomes one of these issues that also comes up in the literature about, um, uh, about Julia, is the question of, of who did what in terms of the studying that was done about these botanical plants. Um, when Charles Schaffer died late in, 19, uh, late in 1903, um, Julia at some point right in there decided that she would write a book and that she, instead of writing the kind of scholarly book that Charles Schaffer was doing, that she would write a popular guide to the flowers that bloom above the clouds. And, um, and which she did, and it came out in, uh, in 1906, published um, in Canada, and then an identical edition in the United States with only the, the title of it being changed that you can see here. And it's really quite a, a, an interesting book. It, it, um, it's got very, um, very limited botanical descriptions. But it has all of these poetic allusions that she is able to bring in because of her, her wide education. So this one here, the windflower, it's going to be very, very difficult for anybody to see. Um, she says that it was, it was Pliny who said that, only the, that, the, that it, it was only the wind that would cause anemones to open. And so this kind of romantic allusion that she was doing. And also in the writing that she did in the introduction that... Um, you know, there's some, some quite wonderful language. You call it flowery language, I suppose, no pun intended, but, uh, you know, behold, before one lies a garden such as kings might envy, and um, after the crossing of the bare bleak rocks, it is like a triumphal entry into paradise. And so she's, she's doing a kind of a popular guide with all of the literary allusions in it. However, her old friend, her, her now old friend, the widow, Mary Schaffer, um, it took it, at least on the basis of letters that Mary Schaffer wrote 30, so, 30 or so years later, that uh, Julia had stolen her husband's work. And if you follow through any of the literature of women writing about the Rocky Mountains and so on at that time, you will find um, uh, this being said, and particularly the two books that I've got up here, um, they, the, the authors of these books have effectively taken Mary Schaffer at face value. Um, I think that Julie was quite inspired by the Schaffers, but she did a very different book. And, and the, uh, the book that Mary Schaffer ended up doing with a botanist from Philadelphia who completed it um, is really uh, completely inaccessible to anybody who isn't a trained botanist. But the, the point in this, I think, and, and dwelling on this, is that I think why Julia made the move that she did to beat the Schaffers to doing the first book on the Canadian mountains was that she wanted that book to be done by British Canadians, not by Americans. There was really a kind of a strategic move in there. 
And um, a theme that runs through uh, Julia's work is very, very much anti-Americanism. Regardless of all of that, uh, Julia was launched and uh, she lectured on, on the, the flora of the Rocky Mountains, on traveling in the Rocky Mountains, and also on Vancouver Island, which she explored on botany. And um, as we go forward into, um, what's that, 1913, that she is um, made a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society. And this was the proudest achievement of her life, um, uh, having the letters FRGS after her name. And interestingly enough, that the, the slides that she had, that she used to illustrate these talks, and they are described in a number of newspaper articles, have always eluded me until just last week. And I got a note, uh, I got an email. Uh, Dear Mr. Kluckner, some friends in Canada have just alerted me to the publication of your book about Julia Henshaw. She was my great grandmother and I have done some talks about her myself, particularly in relation to her magic lantern slides, which I have. They are quite exceptionally well photographed and hand painted, mainly we believe by Julia herself. As a teenager, I saved them from being destroyed on the death of my grandmother, Doris Morden, Julia's only child, as in the early 1970s, there was no interest in magic lantern slides. So my mother, Anne, and her brother, John, could not find any use for them. And uh, she's writing from London, England. So it's amazing, sometimes you've got to publish in order to find the thing that you really wanted before you were to publish. Um, I can, I can see a trip coming up to London quite, quite soon. This is one of, uh, the, these are two of the images that, uh, that she sent along. But it was with images like this that she used to illustrate her talks. And over that period from uh, probably about 1905 right through until, well, she's, she's still doing it in the mid-1920s. I'm going to skip ahead here to another, um, another point where that's a really, really significant in her life, which is during the First World War. And um, for the first year of the First World War, um, Julia, like uh, most women who didn't have any medical training at all, was effectively spinning her wheels. There are records of her organizing concerts as fundraisers uh, and, and also participating in the kind of sock knitting uh, bees that women did at that time to provide um, you know, extra clothing for, uh, for the men who were overseas. But in 1915, and through her involvement with the Imperial Order Daughters of the Empire, uh, she did manage to become involved in the war effort. And, and the, the IODE, Imperial Order Daughters of the Empire, many of you will know this, was founded in 1900. Um, to rally colonial support for the South African War. So very much, of course, British and imperialist. And uh, Julia was national vice president of the, of the IOD. And they decided as an organization that what they would do is put together a campaign to give every fighting Canadian a Christmas present. Uh, this would be the second, effectively the second Christmas of the war. And um, she got the support of the Duke and Duchess of Connaught, and then very interestingly of the Minister of Militia, Sir Sam Hughes, who's one of these rather mercurial characters of the time, um, with, a, with a very dodgy reputation, I think, historically. But uh, Sir Sam Hughes uh, makes her a captain in the Canadian Field Comforts Commission, and this is very often confused, and Julia did nothing to disabuse anybody of the notion that this was being a captain effectively in the Canadian Expeditionary Force, in the Canadian Army. Um, so she went over Christmas of 1915 to France and into Belgium distributing these presents, and then decided that she would stay on and do what she could to find out how servicemen were being treated, what kind of care they were getting, and then with the idea that, uh, that she, would come back to, um, uh, she would come back to Canada and tell people about it. The little photograph there from the Daily Colonist a couple of years later is the only one that I've seen of her in uniform that I've been able to locate. Um, she, uh, she continues on through 1916 and, uh, and 1917 
And lecturing, not just in Canada, but in the United States, that clipping on the left-hand side is from uh, a newspaper in Portland, Oregon. And um, she is um, writing back from the front, raising funds, uh, rallying support, and so on, and, um, and doing a kind of a unique role within, uh, within the war. Uh, probably the most moving of the, of the uh, items that she reported back on would have been her visit to St. Dun Dunstan's Hostel in London where they were treating soldiers and sailors who were blinded from, uh, from the war. And, um, and there are newspaper reports again of her lecturing on, um, uh, lecturing on these, these men being, for, uh, being trained for net making and poultry raising and other other such uh, occupations so that they would, uh, they would have something to do after the war. But her mentor, uh, Sir Sam Hughes, lost his, um, uh, lost his credibility and he was dismissed from the federal cabinet in 1917 and Julia, obviously at the same time, was dispensed with, um, just effectively um, uh, dismissed from her role. Without skipping a beat, she joined the French Red Cross. She's, she's trilingual at least, and then with, with the Latin and Greek on top of it, and is very soon uh, driving ambulance and heading this refugees ambulance section of the Comité Britannique. And this is during the period, a um, hundred years ago last summer, that's called the last hundred days of the war, where the, uh, the German army makes a tremendous last push to capture Paris and capture Calais before the Americans become fully engaged in the war. Uh, the Americans had only joined the war in April of 1917 and they weren't up to full strength and so this big push called the last hundred days that you can see on the map here overran a number of villages and leading to just incredible hardship for um, the uh, uh, for the civilians who were there, the aged people and, and uh, the children. This is the only photograph that I've been able to find in the archives of what these um, women's ambulance brigades looked like. This was a, a British Red Cross one, but there's no reason to believe that the French would really be any different. And I absolutely love the, the, um, uh, the, the kind of easy camaraderie and confidence of these uh, women with their ambulance out uh, near the Western Front in, uh, in 1917. So Julia and her brigade, which she said was uh, composed about equally of, uh, e equally of Canadian and English women, behaved heroically during that summer, evacuating uh, towns and villages during, during this last hundred days. And um, with the result that before the end of 1918, so effectively almost exactly a hundred years ago, she on behalf of her brigade was awarded the Croix de Guerre. The, the highest French military honor uh, for the work that she had done. And um, so that by the early 1920s, uh, in a photograph that was, that was taken by an unknown photographer, but is in the city of Vancouver archives, that she had, uh, she had quite a number of medals to display. And, and I, I think, you know, perhaps it's um, slightly ironic that, uh, that the most elaborate one there at the bottom, the, the, uh, the one with the white cross on it, is actually for her botanical work. It was <laughs> given to her by the Prince of Monaco in, in 1920 at a conference, but the, uh, the, uh, the, the Croix de Guerre is over there on the right-hand side. You begin to lose track of her a little bit in the 1920s. She doesn't appear to have any regular newspaper job. And um, it's only occasionally you can spot her popping up, for example, in, uh, in an article for um, the American version of Country Life magazine published out of New York. And, um, and one of the gardens that she writes about is her garden that she and, um, uh, she and Charles, primarily I'm sure her, had developed at their little house in Caulfield that they called the hut. And reconstructing this has been um, th the most incredible piece of incomplete detective work. Um, they, uh, 
they were up above Marine Drive, of those of you who know Caulfield, um, not in that lower area down along the water. But she planted what I believe is the first, uh, the first alpine garden, the first garden of alpine plants on the west coast, uh, of um, the west coast of Canada with rock work and all the rest of it. And um, as is so often the case that gardens barely outlive their creators. And so to recreate it, this is based on what I believe the property, one corner of the property looked like based on a very blurry photograph in the province in, uh, in 1925, 1926. And the only photograph of the hut and the only photograph of Charles that I had ever seen until last week was this one of a meeting in 1923, and it was actually a celebration for um, uh, Francis Caulfield, the, the namesake of, the, um, uh, of the, the, the Caulfield area itself, who was the, the man seated right in the middle there, and a Canadian Authors Association meeting there. there. You can see quite a modest house, that even though they had an acre and a half of property. It's really, you know, it's not a, not a grand house at all. Charles evidently never did um, become the great provider that perhaps he might have been, um, even though he went into real estate. So, you know, what could he possibly have done wrong there? But one thing about Charles, and I didn't mention this, um, was that he became the, um, he was the chief recruiting officer for Vancouver during the First World War and uh, operated out of a tent on Victory Square, on, on what we now call Victory Square. And uh, even though his appointment was very soundly criticized when it happened because people said, well, he's really just a good fellow and so on, but he has no experience. He actually did extremely well and he signed up nearly 8,000 men for the volunteer um, uh, various regiments of the, of the Canadian Expeditionary Force at that time. So Doris, born 1889, the only daughter of Julia and, and uh, Charles. And that in itself is, is interesting. I don't know how we would find out why there was only one child, but they're typically women of that period, multiple pregnancies, big families, all the rest of it. So whatever, whatever the reason was, um, uh, there was only Doris. And all of the indications are that she was rather ignored as a child, that her mother was very busy and, and, and uh, so on, and um, that she couldn't really wait to get out of the house. This was um, information that I gleaned from people who had known her, people I interviewed back in the 1980s. She married um, a man named Grant Morden, who was a, a Toronto piano salesman who had a kind of a financial acumen, and a, an accountant's acumen, and, um, and a real ambition to him. And um, this was in 1909 when they married. And 1910, 1911, Grant Morden is putting together Canada's steamship lines. He is about eight years, eight years older than Doris, so born in, actually born in 1880. So a young, very ambitious, very, very capable man. And um, he does, uh, by about 1912, he does what, so, what quite a number of Canadians did at that time. He moves to, uh, he moves to England like a, like a Beaver Brook, like an Andrew Boner Law, like the, like the other people at that time. And um, he makes a fortune during the First World War. Uh, I, I'm not saying that he was a war profiteer, but he had interests in British Empire Steel, British Empire Steel Corporation and uh, a number of other um, industries that were obviously doing really uh, very, very well in war work. So that by 1916, they had uh, purchased, Grant and Doris had purchased a property called Heatherden Hall in Berkshire, just to the west of London. 152 acres with a big Georgian house on it. It's now Pinewood Studios. It's been Pinewood Studios since the, uh, uh, since the 1930s. And uh, Grant becomes, uh, Grant Morden becomes a British MP, member of parliament, uh, becomes quite influential in a kind of a second tier in the, uh, in the British government. The Irish Free State Treaty is signed in the drawing room at Heatherden Hall in 1921. And, uh, and he becomes the country squire. And so that, uh, that portrait on the left-hand side is by a man by the name of Leslie Ward, who went by the, uh, the, the artistic name of Spy. 
And, um, and that is of Grant Morton as the master of the Avon Vale hunt. So he is more English than the English. He is the unspeakable in pursuit of the inedible. He's become the kind of country squire at the time. And then the photograph on the right-hand side, of course, is uh, the Prince of Wales, later Edward VIII, uh, at a reception at Heatherton Hall. Um, Morden spent about 300,000 pounds fixing up Heatherton Hall during the 1920s, but lost it all in 1929, 1930. Just absolutely crashed and burned. Uh, no other way to describe it. Having made no provision for his wife and their four children. And uh, so by 1932, he's declared officially bankrupt. His health collapses when he is denied access into the House of Commons. And, um, and he, dies, uh, he dies almost blind at the age of 52, leaving Doris to go out and look for work as a kind of a paid lady's companion, this sort of thing that a, that a woman could do at that time, and to try to raise her children. So that lack of connection um, uh, with the family back, with the depression on here, and with Julia not having made a whole lot of money, indicates why there wasn't a whole lot of um, a real connection between the families and the time. The photograph on the right of Doris making a wartime marriage to a private in the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry, a man who was the son of a, of a Rhodesian colonial official, was just one of those wartime things that only lasted a few years. And, um, and Doris lived on into the early 1970s. Um, back to Julia. Um, uh, Charles died of a heart attack in Rome. There's evidence that, that he and Julia were well enough off that they were able to go and spend the winters. They were kind of overwintering in the south of France or in, or in Italy during the 1920s. Um, Julia's own health began to slide even in the 19, um, late 1920s when she's getting to be about age of, age of 60. And uh, she reappears in the kind of public record that I've been able to find in the early 1930s writing for the Vancouver Sun. And she takes over being the book reviewer in the bookshelf column there. Um, she does about 1933 through 1936. And um, she dies suddenly, very, very suddenly um, at uh, age 69 uh, in, in 1937, so suddenly that her final column is printed the same day as her obituary. So she was obviously uh, in harness right up until the, uh, in the last minute, which amounted to the grand sum of $6,000, which is not a lot of money in 1937. Um, ended up, I suppose, being probated and, and uh, going to her daughter, Doris, who came back. And uh, she commissioned a two-side uh, windows here uh, at the, uh, uh, the the sweet little Anglican church in Caulfield and um, the one on the left is for Charles and the one on the right is for Julia the one in the middle is for Francis Caulfield himself and um, the the text on the right hand one reads um, to the memory of Julia W Henshaw FRGS authorist and botanist 1870 to 1937, this window was given by her daughter. She's buried in Mountain View Cemetery, Julia is, in a very, very modest grave, very, very modest grave, that I must see my way to getting restored, I think, at some point. Um, and you'll notice in this a couple of things. First, that, that FRGS is there, that her, her proudest achievement of being uh, a member of the Royal Geographical Society, and also that the date's been moved up one notch to 1871. So it kind of follows, it kind of tracks through her life. She was born in 1868, and she, when she dies, she was born in 1871. So one of those kind of quirks of personality, I suppose you would say. So is she important? Is she, is she more than just a curiosity, um, uh, an unusual person? What can we learn from from studying a life like hers? Where, where does she really fit in? Um, on the matter of social class servants and race, uh, in Julia's world there was a place for everyone, but everyone was in their place. Um, 
you, you, there, there's no mobility really between classes and certainly not for people who are non-white uh, in, in her world. But nevertheless, in the things that she writes, she is in a very patronizing way, that it's rather cringe-making to read. Um, she's, she's really fond of the Chinese. Uh, she, the, she believes that they, they are essential to, um, to, to Vancouver getting by, um, to, to the sort of things that women wanted to do. Um, uh, to, to give women the freedom so that women could be creative, so that women could have a little bit of leisure, so that women could pursue careers, that they needed servants, cleaning ladies. It's really not much difference between um, then and, and, uh, and now. Um, she, uh, she particularly uh, writes after the uh, September 1907 riot, um, she writes about how, how shameful it was for Vancouverites to riot against the, the Asian community who were living peaceably among us uh, under the laws of uh, Canada and, the, and the, uh, the, the traditions of Great Britain. And she uses the opportunity uh, when she's writing the week after the riot to get in a really good anti-American dig, that being another one of the things, because one of the principal uh, fomenters of that riot in September 1907 was a man named Fowler, who was the head of the uh, Asiatic Exclusion League in Bellingham, and had come up, to, uh, come up for the demonstration. But in this idea of Julia having, there's a place for everyone and everyone in their place, it's interesting to go through. So Chinese good, Japanese bad. Japanese bad because Japanese wanted all of the rights of citizenship. Japanese didn't know their place. Sikhs are good because they are Britain's loyal Sikhs. And she defends in her column a number of times uh, slights addressed at at Sikhs, at South Asian people, and demands that the people writing this in the other newspapers effectively put up, show some proof, effectively. Um, indigenous people, effectively invisible. Um, she writes very, very little about it, and it's quite evident that her, her views of the wilderness, well, the wilderness was an unpeopled place under God's gaze, effectively. That it didn't really have an indigenous population in it. But she makes an exception for Pauline Johnson, whom she admires hugely as a poet. But also, Pauline Johnson is a Mohawk, and the Mohawks were loyal to Britain. So, you know, all of these things kind of fit together in, in, a, in a, 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 very, a very kind of a consistent worldview that she had. On the, um, on the matter of imperialism, I, I found this, in a way, to be amongst the most tiresome parts of her, um, uh, of her personality. Um, she has no time for the Canadian ensign. Uh, she thinks that the Union Jack should fly over Canada. Uh, she writes stridently about the need for Canada to support the British Navy and not to start its own Navy. And so she's completely at odds with the mood expressed by the Laurier government in that first decade of the 20th century of moving more towards Canadian independence. Um, Anti-Americanism, lots of very amusing things that she wrote in her column of, of her dislike of Americans. And I mentioned earlier about how I believe that she set out so intently to beat the Philadelphians with that botanical book because she wanted the first one to be done by Canadians. Um, and I've mentioned the, uh, the IODE. Um, on all of these matters of women's rights and roles, um, a couple of quotes here going back. She, very clearly, she did have to make a living. She had to make a significant part of the family living by her writing. And, um, and she was very self-promotional. Uh, there's no question of this. But then, I am very self-promotional. Every writer, artist, musician I know is very self-promotional. So in that way, she seems very modern. She seems very much like a person of our time, rather than um, people of the Victorian era who, who tended to stay within their class, and if they did write, they would write under pseudonyms. And uh, even with her second novel in 1901, she wrote that under her own name. Um, 
And that uh, little quote on the, on the left-hand side, that's her during the war. She's encouraging women to go out and get jobs and be proud of what they're doing and, and uh, participate. This theme of domination of women by men comes up mainly in her novels. In her first novel, she has a very interesting character, um, a concert pianist who is told by her fiancé that when she marries, she will no longer be able to perform in public. And very clearly, you know, a sympathetic woman character and, and uh, who is really oppressed by, uh, by this fiancé. And in, uh, in Why Not Sweetheart, which is the one that's set in the Kootenays, there's this marvelous farce involving the beautiful 17-year-old orphan Naomi Crocus, who is dominated by her guardian, who is a professor from Cambridge University, Professor Panhandle. And in one of those tropes of the Victorian novel that the guardian wants to marry his, his charge, wants to marry the orphan, even though he's in his 40s and she's 17. And so he sets out to dominate her and there's this wonderful scene that, that, um, that kills him off and she's able to marry the, the young man that, uh, that she loves at the end of the novel. But the really big question is the one on women's suffrage. Um, and a, a lot of you, if any of you have ever read anything about Julia Henshaw, will know that, that she was anti-suffrage. And, and you've got all of these threads of her being kind of a modern woman, an independent woman, and so on. And she obviously did not make a public statement, or there would not have been this, this statement in her column that, um, that, that she ought to embark on a campaign in favor of women's suffrage. And I love her language in this, that she would sooner put her hand in a hornet's nest. And then that, that final statement, I nail my colors to the mast and await the storm. I mean, she had a, had a sense of drama in it. Um, it's all about social class, and it's all about um, keeping the uh, electorate as small as possible. So in, again, entirely consistent with the way that she was brought up. And, um, and in a way, when you, when you look at her and you think, well, she really is not so old fashioned in that when you look at the, um, uh, the way that elections are going now around the world, whether it's poll taxes in Britain or whether it's um, uh, voter registration restrictions in the United States or whether it's attack ads here, here, there and everywhere. There are groups that are trying to reduce the size of, of the electorate down as far as possible. And Julia was just doing this in, uh, in a way that, that uh, fitted in entirely consistently with her beliefs as a member of a well-educated, entirely engaged class of people. Um, you will have noticed that I'm a character in this, uh, you know, Madeline was saying, and, and those of you, all of you will have known and read biographies where the author is a character in it, whether it's the use of the conditional tense, she might have seen, she would have met. Um, the author's saying, uh, the author traveled to this and everything. I've just been a little bit more direct about her. And I found in this too, that particularly that, um, I become tired of authors having the last word in biographies. And, uh, and so I got Julia to talk back uh, <laughs> throughout this thing. Because I can't imagine her, if she could see this, allowing me to make a statement about her being uh, racist or imperialist or um, being disappointed in her for anti-suffrage. She would just want to talk right back to me. So. Um, it's in a way, as the deeper that I got into this, the closer I got to the end, the more I realized that I was seeing something of, in her world, I was seeing so, that in something of the world that we are creating now. Um, that, that she would say, well, you're just a bunch of hypocrites. You're saying that you've, that you've made progress towards a different kind of a world. And you can just, I can just imagine her talking back to me, and so I had her, finish the book talking back to me and effectively putting everything into perspective from her point of view. I guess my point in this is, and as I was getting near the end of this, I was realizing that um, the world that created Julia Henshaw is pretty much the world that we are recreating right now. And um, a few of the details have changed, but we have the same 
astonishingly unequal society. We have the same kind of locked-in social class for, for groups of people. And depending on where you are in the world, you would find that effectively when you're reading Julia Henshaw's uh, life and work, you're reading a story that could almost be contemporary. Um, I don't want you to go away thinking that this is just a comic book. This is a real book. It has, it has uh, real back notes to it. It has, uh, it has a bibliography and an index and so on. And um, so I tried to do justice to her. And perhaps if somewhere out there, there are diaries or there are um, letters or that type of thing, that standard grist for the mill of a biographer, then uh, there'd be the opportunity to do a more formal work. But um, uh, I'll leave it there. This is what I was able to do. Thank you all very much. Thank you.